Um, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here today to talk with this whole department. I think you know, I've sort of seen grand rounds over the years, and it's really cool to actually be presenting on a topic that I really care about. Um, so without further ado, so my disclosures, I'm a co-investigator um, on a clinical trial funded by uh, the nonprofit USONA Institute, and I receive salary support from philanthropic contributions from these folks. Um, by the end of the hour today, which will be a bit of a whirlwind hour, um, I hope that you will come away being able to describe the current status of psychedelic drug development and a few other avenues through which patients might be accessing psychedelics, um, to understand the commonly used treatment approach in this treatment and some associated limitations and opportunities, and to describe some of the future directions and the role of um, academic medical centers and psychiatrists specifically. Um, so we've had multiple grand rounds presentations from other members of our research group in the past few years, and by now, many of you are probably well aware that there's a growing body of literature that's found that just a few doses of psilocybin or MDMA given in a supported setting can produce rapid and substantial improvement in a variety of psychiatric conditions. Um, and that, that improvement can be durable and long-lasting in some cases. Um, and if proven to be safe and effective in larger studies, psychedelics might provide a very attractive opportunity and alternative for patients who have either had incomplete relief with their existing treatment um, or would prefer not to take a daily medication, among many other reasons. Um, and there's variable excitement among clinicians and researchers in this area, and some speculate that this has uh, the potential to really radically change the mental health care landscape, leading to rather ominous headlines like this one from the Times a few years ago, uh, warning us of the coming psychedelic revolution and that psychiatry might not ever be the same. Um, but how exactly is it likely to change and where exactly are psychiatrists going to fit in? How do we get ready? Um, that's what I'll try to give you an overview of in today's talk. To briefly define some terms, classic psychedelics are those that function mainly via serotonin 2A receptor agonism or partial agonism. They include psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, DMT, among others. Um, and there are other drugs with distinct mechanisms, um, sometimes discussed for their so-called psychedelic or manif uh, mind manifesting effects um, that function through other uh, mechanisms. And most notably, this includes MDMA, which is a methamphetamine derivative, um, and ketamine and energy receptor antagonist, and so um, along with salvia, I began other drugs. Um, and when I talk about psychedelics in this talk, I'm mainly going to be talking about psilocybin and MDMA, a little bit of ketamine, uh, but this is what I mean when I say psychedelics. So in the first part of this talk, I'll take you through um, the two major pathways through which access to psychedelics is increasing. Um, and the first involves the more conventional above ground developments that are gonna lead to access through more or less standard clinical settings. Um, so this is standard drug development, which may eventually lead to rescheduling of schedule one substances um, like MDMA and psilocybin. And it also includes the uh, drugs like ketamine, which are already being prescribed off label for a variety of indications. Um, and the second involves a whole slew of other means by which people might access psychedelics, uh, which in some ways are competing with this with this pathway here. Um, and this includes state and local legalization and decriminalization, religious use exceptions, international retreat centers, and the like. Um, and access to psychedelics through these other means is and will be somewhat less regulated or very much less regulated. For many of them, a clinical diagnosis is not even going to be needed, which has all sorts of interesting implications, but we'll take it away. So in this first pathway, um, there's one company seeking approval for MDMA for PTSD, and there are two companies seeking approval for psilocybin for major depressive disorder and resistant depression. Um, and all three have received this breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA, meaning that the FDA is committed to expediting the drug development process for these um, therapies, that they see some promise in them and they want to see the studies completed as soon as possible. Um, many of the existing studies in this pathway have been you know, criticized for having small samples or open label designs, uh, but more rigorous uh, data from larger samples is rapidly becoming available. Um, and the company sponsoring the development of MDMA for PTSD actually collected its last piece of data for phase three back in November. Um, and by some estimates, they might have clinical approval as early as 
a year from now in Q1 of 2024. Um, psilocybin might take a little bit longer, a couple more years, but uh, we might see clinical MDMA, medical MDMA as soon as uh, a year from now. So I'll just briefly cover a couple of the major um, findings in, in, in this area uh, for these two treatments. So this is from the MDMA for PTSD phase two study sponsored by MAPS. Um, participants had a clinical diagnosis of PTSD with a severe CAPS-5 score. And the authors found that uh, three doses of MDMA here in red, uh, which supported psychotherapy, results in meaningful improvements in PTSD symptoms relative to three doses of placebo. Um, the change in the CAPS-5 score was about 24 points in MDMA and about 14 points in the placebo group. Uh, the primary study endpoint here at about 18 weeks um, just about two-thirds of participants in the MDMA group no longer met criteria for PTSD compared with 32% of those in the placebo group. Um, and with respect to safety, they had pretty decent outcomes. There weren't any especially concerning signals about um, increased risk of suicidal ideation or anything of the like. Um, and this is from a more recently published study, which is the largest trial to date using psilocybin, in which um, 233 adults across Europe and uh, the U.S. with treatment-resistant depression were randomized to receive a single dose of either um, high-dose psilocybin at 25 milligrams here in blue, a medium dose of 10 milligrams, or a very low dose, essentially a placebo dose of one milligram. Um, participants had to have failed two to four medication trials in the current depressive episode to qualify. And the authors found that the 25 milligram group, but not the 10 milligram group had significantly uh, more efficacy at reducing depressive symptoms than the one milligram group at three weeks. That was a primary outcome time point here. Um, the high dose group had a response rate of about 37% at three weeks, which is significantly lower than um, existing smaller studies using psilocybin. Um, so there were two major studies looking at uh, patients with depression, one in treatment-resistant folks and, and one that was not. And both had rates of response in the, in the ballpark of around 60 to 70%. So 37% is a lot lower. Um, I think many people expected the response rates to be lower here, but um, they, and they were. Uh, and in short, the intervention was found to be superior to placebo, uh, but significantly less effective than in prior studies. Um, a caveat was that this study had just one dose instead of two doses compared to um, some of the other studies out there, and they also had less psychotherapeutic support um, in this study. Um, and I'll note that both this uh, study from Compass and the study in the prior slide used a similar treatment model involving two therapists providing at least several hours of preparatory and follow-up psychotherapy, um, which we'll get into in a little bit about well, like, what is that actually going to look like if this leaves the laboratory. Um, and one other point was just uh, about the study was some concerns that it raised about safety. Um, there were three documented cases of suicidal behavior in this study, um, and all of them occurred in this high dose group. Um, about one to two months after treatment, all of those cases were in non-responders. Um, they included two aborted suicide attempts and one um, plan, sort of gathering materials for an attempt that wasn't carried through. Um, all three of those people did have risk factors, including prior attempts or uh, prior self-injurious behavior. Um, it is concerning, though, that all, all three occurred in this high-dose group, and we do need a little bit better research about uh, why why that occurred or how we might mitigate that risk in the future for vulnerable groups. So um, the clinical trials are steadily progressing, and MDMA in particular is going to be available soon. Um, and what does clinical rollout look like in, in the event that these therapies are actually approved? Who's going to provide the treatment and what training are they going to need? Uh, well, there is actually no consensus on what training or licensure ought to be required for psychedelic therapists. Um, the availability of trained therapists is likely to be a rate limiting factor here in people accessing this treatment. So if you think about um, the total addressable market out there, the number of people who might be in the market for this kind of care, so people with uh, PTSD or depression who have not responded to treatment, that number uh, is in the millions and it would require tens of thousands of therapists to administer care. Um, so MAPS, the sponsor of the MDMA study, is 
pouring resources into training this workforce that they anticipate needing in the coming years. Um, meanwhile, prescriber training requirements are actually likely to be pretty minimal. As far as I know, there, there might not even be any prescriber training coming out of MAPS or any other groups. Um, and if MDMA and psilocybin are approved, a lot of the evaluation and prescribing might actually be done by folks who are not psychiatrists um, or who don't necessarily have any mental health training. Or, um, you know, if you look at what's happening in ketamine clinics right now, a lot of them are led by anesthesiologists, emergency medicine folks, family medicine doctors, um, some mid-level providers who don't have specific mental health training. Um, and... Another kind of concerning issue is that it's not really totally clear that payers are going to reimburse for this two therapist model that is used in these studies because it's kind of a lot. And so let's talk a little bit about that model and what actually happens um, when someone comes to a place like Hopkins or approaches one of these entities to participate in a trial. Um, it's uh, similar to the two the two studies that I just highlighted here, but essentially participants show up, they undergo a pretty thorough medical and psychological screening. Um, back in the day, this used to take two whole days. We pushed it down into one at Hopkins, but it's still kind of a lot. Um, and then they undergo a, a period of preparation, usually about six to eight hours of contact with two study facilitators, um, one of whom is usually uh, has a clinical training background of some sort or clinical licensure. The other might be um, might also be a, a trained therapist, but in some cases is a research assistant or coordinator or someone with a bachelor's level of education. And the point of prep is to build rapport. Um, part of that is done through a life review, or just talking through the person's life story, how they got there, what's important to them. Um, in some cases, there's use of a specific therapeutic modality like CBT or motivational interviewing, but not always. Um, and a big part of PrEP is also an overview of what to expect on drug administration days. So drug effects, uh, tools to handle drug effects that are more challenging and the like. So this is what happens on the drug administration day. Usually there are about one to three of them, sometimes more. Uh, and these are all day affairs, usually about seven or more hours in duration. Um, and during the, the day, session guides generally take kind of a non-directive approach. So they're sitting back for the most part, they're available if the participant is in distress or requires some additional support. Um, but there's always at least one person in the room with the patient. So if someone needs to take a bathroom or a lunch break, they're, they're not leaving the participant or the volunteer alone. Um, and this is followed by this sort of integration period. So after the drug dosing days, there are multiple meetings with both facilitators, um, usually you know a day after, a week after. And during these meetings, they review the experiences of the session day and any interim events. Um, the, the point of all this is to help the participant understand and incorporate insights from the experience into their daily lives or to discuss any challenges or changes that have come up in that time, just have support around that. Gradually, the, the meeting frequency is tapered um, through long-term follow-up. So there might be, you know, weekly meetings in the beginning, tapered to once every month or every two or three months, all the way out to six to 12 months, however long the study follow-up period is. Um, and some of the larger studies, like the ones we uh, just went through, actually have lower levels of follow-up support. They might only have two or three follow-up visits, and that's kind of it. Um, but the bottom line is that it's still actually kind of a lot of psychotherapy, uh, which leads into this question, how much does this all cost and who's going to pay for it? So um, for the MAPS trial, which involved three dosing sessions, the cost was actually about $11,500 per participant. Um, so, you know, even though this is billed as sort of a, a you know, a quick, sleek intervention, it's really, it really is quite a lot more than just a couple of doses of psychedelic. It's a huge amount of psychotherapeutic support. 90 plus percent of this number is uh, for clinician compensation, basically. And that's a high upfront investment for insurance companies, as you might imagine. Uh, but the authors of this paper calculated that, you know, in the long run, this will save quite a lot of money if it is indeed more effective than existing care, as, as it seems to be um, in some of these early papers. So they, they anticipate that it would break even at about four years. Um, so again, quite a lot of upfront investment over the initial period, which might make payers kind of uh, think very carefully about whether they might want to cover this. 
Um, an important point here is that, you know, even if um, the, the care is likely to be delivered by teams, basically, with most of the actual therapy, the prep, the dosing, integration, um, being led by a master's level therapist to save on costs, right? Um, the screening, prescribing, emergency medical coverage is more likely to be covered by providers with prescriptive authority just because they have to have prescriptive authority. Um, and in the community, a lot of these might be mid-level providers. And so even though I, I'm constantly being uh, contacted by psychiatrists and trainees in psychiatry who want to do this and have an interest in it, it's kind of unlikely that psychiatrists themselves are going to be routinely sitting with patients in treatment rooms in, in this manner here. Um, and it all comes down to the models of compensation, basically. Um, but psychiatrists are probably actually pretty well suited to lead teams like this, given their extensive knowledge of, you know, the basis of mental health issues, risk management, uh, ability to detect and manage adverse outcomes and, and the like. Um, a big question is whether this two therapist model is going to survive. We don't really have a great sense of that. Um, you know, on the cons, it's very resource intensive. It limits access if you need to wrangle two therapists instead of just one to get your treatment. Um, and on the other hand, though, this this is the model that's produced the results that we've seen so far. It's probably safer, you know, to have somebody in the room at all times, to have some accountability, to make sure that there's no, you know unusual or problematic behavior from therapists in the room. Um, and it's ideal for apprenticeship, sort of for training the, the next you know generation of clinicians. It's actually great because you just sort of sit together and, uh, and you have some supervision right next to you. Um, some alternatives include maybe a single therapist model. It's rumored that some of the future phase three studies are gonna move toward this um, because of the issues surrounding costs. Group therapy is another alternative. It's been studied in a couple of uh, clinical trials at this point. And um, there might be some logistical hurdles with coordinating the care and schedules of multiple patients and therapists for this sort of thing, but it is possible that it would work out. Um, and a third option, which pharma companies might eventually be angling toward in a sort of race to the bottom is having no particular requirement for a therapist to be in the room at all. Um, this hasn't been studied yet, but you can bet that someone out there is going to be um, pushing for this or maybe just uh, trying to figure out who is uh, a good candidate for not needing a therapist in the room, right? After all, many people just use psychedelics on their own uh, recreationally and report good and transformative experiences. Um, so again, it's not really clear if or when payers are gonna be reimbursing for psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, this is gonna require the creation of new billing codes, which is about a two year process. Um, it has gotten started, the ball's gotten rolling. The CPT review board of editorial panel is actually reviewing a number of codes this month uh, that were put together by Compass and MAPS. Um, and, you know, even though these are not even approved yet, the last several years have seen like billions of dollars of private sector investment. There are many, many clinics, brick and mortar establishments getting set up in anticipation of these drugs being approved. Um, many of them are very aesthetically pleasing spaces like this, kind of like a boutique or a spa. Um, and many of them are offering fee-for-service off-label ketamine to generate income while they're waiting around for MDMA and psilocybin to be rescheduled. Um, it's not really clear that these groups are going to be especially likely to even accept insurance if some payers do offer reimbursement. Um, and so, you know, there's a concern that treatment might be limited to those people of means who can afford it in places like this. Um, what about ketamine? Ketamine could be its own separate series of lectures <laughs> to put a slide to it here. Um, just to say that, yes, we're seeing that ketamine is being used widely as an off-label treatment for depression um, and other indications. Um, clinics are often run by non-psychiatric providers, and there's so much enthusiasm and interest that it's created this, you know, a whole professional society, SKP3, devoted to its use for a variety of conditions. Um, the relationship between subjective drug effects and outcomes is less clear relative to classic psychedelics. Um, you know, there are many clinics out there just offering infusion therapy, not really offering any kind of psychotherapeutic support around it, and they seem to be quite effective. And there's, uh, you know, growing literature on um, the biological mechanisms by which ketamine might be an, an effective antidepressant. 
However, the longer term risks are not especially well characterized and um, some patients end up needing to be, you know, chronically taking ketamine to maintain their, their, their well-being, which is a bit of a concern. Um, and of course, there's also intranasal S ketamine approved for major depressive disorder. And we have clinics here at Hopkins for that already. Um, so what about the the other routes, the alternative routes to access here? So, you know, the last few years have seen tremendous levels of public and scientific interest in these drugs with glowing media coverage. Um, this figure from a paper from our colleagues here demonstrates the sort of hype cycle that we're in, that we're probably somewhere near this peak of inflated expectations. Um, and along the way, one consequence of rising in this peak has, has been a number of alternative routes to access that have proliferated. And for better or for worse, the ways that folks can regularly access psychedelics or easily access psychedelics are, are increasing. Um, a major change has been state and local level legalization and decriminalization efforts. And so Colorado and Oregon are the main states here that have now passed um, legislation to legalize use of psilocybin. Um, Colorado has also legalized use of a number of other psychedelics. Um, and they did so for non-medical use. Um, another handful of states are sort of on their way. These are here in yellow and, and light blue. Um, certain cities across the country also have decriminalization to some extent, including Washington, D.C., our neighbor. Um, Connecticut is an interesting case where the state government has actually now approved setting aside funds to specifically have medical use for veterans of, with psilocybin and MDMA ahead of any federal approval. Um, it sounds like they might be running into some interesting logistical issues with rolling that out, but it's a pilot program that they expect to bridge people until federal approval, which is interesting. Um, in terms of the state initiatives, right, so Oregon is the furthest along. There was a ballot measure that was passed back in 2020, um, and the Oregon Psilocybin Services Board has now released guidance on requirements for various kinds of licenses that they will be offering for manufacturers, for facilitators, um, and access is actually expected to happen sometime this year for uh, people who want it. Um, and the thing to note here is that the, the mushrooms themselves are not what's been studied in clinical trials that we've discussed so far. It's in, in clinical studies, we usually use synthetic psilocybin, but in Oregon, what's being legalized is actual mushrooms and mushroom extracts, which can vary quite a bit in psilocybin content. They might have issues with being shelf stable. Um, and under the Oregon model, psilocybin is going to be available for what's being called supported adult use without the need for any kind of clinical diagnosis. So this is not actually medical use. This is, I think they were trying to bill it as medical use before, but realize they're going to run because of weird legal issues if they call it that. Um, so individuals are not going to be required to have any kind of diagnosis. Um, you won't have to be an Oregon resident to be able to come visit Oregon to do this. The only requirement is being 21, taking part in a preparation session, and follow-up is going to be optional. Uh, which, and there are a number of concerns, apart from just how that might sound. Um, there's actually going to be no clinical evaluation of any sort required. Um, people will have a little checklist that they check off during the informed consent process, asking them if they've ever had or currently have psychosis, uh, suicidal ideation, pregnancy and, and lithium use, those seem to be the only um, contraindications. And weirdly, history of mania is not on there. Um, that's been a, a contraindication for most of the studies to date. Um, and again, these are all based on self-report. So anyone can very easily show up and uh, say that they've never had this when they really did. And facilitators are going to have to have a minimum of a high school diploma or equivalent and the completion of about a 120 hour training program. So many facilitators um, are not even going to have, have any formal clinical training to recognize you know, potential adverse outcomes or support people through that. So that's a bit of concern. Some of that is kind of covered in this 120 hour training program, but um, it's not quite equivalent to standard clinical training. Um, this is from our neighbors down the road in DC. This was back in 2020. They actually passed a bill to um, decriminalize or to lower the priority of law enforcement related to possession of uh, mushrooms, uh, boga, cacti. Um, 
And, you know, psilocybin products are, in effect, pretty easy to purchase in D.C. and gifting shops in the same way that cannabis is able to purchase right now, where you go to a store, you buy, like, you know, an $80 T-shirt, and you are gifted a, a cannabis or psychedelic uh, product of some sort. And so even though it's not exactly legal, it's actually quite easy to access. And they're trying to crack down, but they're not really doing a, an especially good job, it seems like. And this has been accompanied by some of the previously underground services kind of coming to the surface as seen with this particular company that can set you up with a, a trip sitter uh, where you bring your own psychedelic. You know, they live in the purple states. They can come to the green states. They offer a, a ceremonial package with a bit of prep and integration. And you get a microdose coaching thing thrown in, even though microdosing has not really been proven to be effective for anything in the laboratory just yet. Um, and all this can be yours for anywhere from $1,500 to $4,000, depending on your level of income. Um, retreats have also been proliferating for about a decade or more. Uh, this includes programs in places like the Netherlands, Jamaica, Costa Rica, that are more permissive of psychedelics. Uh, and it's created a very sizable industry um, with varying levels of support and quality across facilities. And as you can see, there's retreat groups but like hotels.com for psychedelic retreats they've coordinated uh or booked retreats for over seven seven hundred thousand customers at this point um group therapy is more or less standard in those places some but not all have physicians or mental health providers on site they really vary with the kind of screening or support that they offer um, many have these sort of cushy resort-like environs and it usually costs thousands of bucks to participate in experience um, so again it's usually limited to people with means um, and a final route i'll briefly mention is that of uh, religious use exceptions there are a couple of churches in the u.s um, including the native american church and the um, Uniao de vegetal which originated in brazil but has a couple of branches in the u.s um, to use certain psychedelics um, and there are a lot of other psilocybin or ayahuasca churches that run in an underground fashion that don't have actual clearance, but any religious group can apply for an exception to the Controlled Substances Act. Um, all this is to say that psychedelic use is, is on the rise. So this is data from uh, a survey of young adults. We've had our highest all-time ever past year use of psychedelics reported. It's about 8% in 2021. Um, up from about, you know, 4% or so 10 years ago. Um, people are using these drugs more and more, and I wouldn't be surprised if the last couple of years of data are even uh, more pronounced in, in their increase in use. MDMA is actually the only drug in this category that has had decreasing rates of use. Everything else, LSD, psilocybin, peyote, um, are on the rise. So in this landscape, uh, how and what can psychiatrists actually contribute, right? If people could just go down to their local gifting store and get a bunch of psychedelics and call up um, a, a trip sitter to come visit them, like where do we fit in? Uh, we don't usually offer spa-like facilities. Uh, we might be at a disadvantage there. Um, so I'd like to provide a couple of examples of why I think psychiatrists will have a critical role and for whom. Um, and this will start with some of the data collected in our waiting list control study of psilocybin for major depressive disorder. Um, in this study, we had you know 24 people. They were randomized to receive either immediate treatment with two doses of psilocybin or delayed treatment after eight weeks. And as you could see um, in this waiting period, there's a quite significant difference between um, the immediate and delayed treatment groups. Um, after the delayed treatment group folks received their treatment, they also had some pretty pronounced efficacy with Cohen's D on the order of two. So a very, very large effect size. Um, we combined all of the, the data from the immediate and the delayed response groups to follow them up over the course of a year and found that the mean improvements in depression at three through 12 months actually remained pretty comparable to um, what we saw early on. We had 100% retention. It was, uh, it was pretty remarkable to see and very encouraging, suggested the effects of psilocybin might be kind of durable. Um, you know, the response and remission rates, again, were quite quite similar throughout the entire uh, follow-up period, which is all in all great news, but it does come with some caveats. 
Um, and the caveats are related to what we observed during that follow-up period regarding other kinds of treatment. So uh, by 12 months, uh, a third of the sample reported using some other treatment, such as a daily antidepressant of some sort, at least for a little while. So this could be an SSRI, SNRI, NDRI, something of the like. So eight people out of 24, it's kind of a lot. Um, and 40% reported having had some psychotherapy at some point. Nobody used additional psilocybin outside of the study for their report, so that's not a confounder. Um, but overall, it's likely that some of the improvement we saw over time was not due exclusively to the psilocybin, but due to other kinds of care that people were receiving. And we ran a few analyses comparing those who did and didn't um, begin use of an antidepressant during follow-up and found that antidepressant users were more depressed at baseline, um, but otherwise didn't really differ in demographic characteristics or the duration of a current depressive episode or whether they had used medication in the current episode. Um, in short, I think this you know, suggests that psilocybin can be helpful, and um, but a sizable portion of people, especially those who are more depressed at baseline, um, might need something more. That might be additional doses, that might be other kinds of um, antidepressant treatments or psychotherapy. A lot more research is needed, but um, I'm sure this is not a silver bullet. It's not gonna sort of replace our entire toolkit. And I'll, I'll now turn your attention to another issue that's probably might affect a, a pretty large subset of our patients and their ability to benefit from this kind of care. So it's estimated that about um, two thirds of people who carry a depression diagnosis in the US are being treated with an antidepressant drug. Um, current antidepressant use has been exclusionary for most trials that involve psilocybin or MDMA. And the reason is that there's um, limited but convincing data that serotonergic antidepressants actually can blunt the effects of both classic psychedelics and MDMA. Um, few studies early on in this like new era of research since early 2000s have collected rigorous data on pre-study medication use. Um, some studies did allow drug tapering after enrollment, usually it just requires four to five half-lives, like a washout period so that no remaining antidepressant is in your bloodstream. Um, but a growing body of data actually suggests that there might be some clinically significant residual effects from antidepressant use that persist beyond this five half-life window. Um, an example comes from uh, this study published in the New England Journal a couple of years back, which compared, uh, had a pretty interesting design and compared two high dose psilocybin sessions here in red to six weeks of escitalopram. Uh, people got either two very low dose placebo doses and daily escitalopram, or they got two high dose psilocybin sessions and daily placebo. Um, Unfortunately, the authors failed to find a significant difference in their primary pre pre-designated outcome here uh, at six weeks in their QIDS scores. So they were almost significant, but not quite. Um, however, almost all of the secondary outcomes that they used, including other every other measurement of depression, like the BDI, the Gridhelm D, uh, were significant, but they weren't able to report that. Uh, they didn't control for uh, multiple comparisons in their analysis. Um, Suffice it to say that they, they almost found a difference, but they didn't quite in this QIDS score outcome. Um, and in a secondary analysis of that study, the authors actually found that the people who tapered off of their antidepressant when they came into the study had numerically less improvement um, after being treated with psilocybin. So here's those people who were discontinued from SSRI or SNRI. The psilocybin group had an improvement of uh, about six points on the QIDS. Meanwhile, the escitalopram group had an improvement of eight points. Um, and when the analysis was limited to those who did not discontinue a med prior to getting psilocybin, psilocybin was actually clearly superior uh, and significant, significantly better than the escitalopram condition. Um, and there's another secondary analysis from a, a handful of the MDMA for PTSD trials that showed a similar kind of issue. This is from Fiducia and colleagues. Um, what they found basically is if you take a look at people who were tapered off of an antidepressant versus those who were not, there was quite a difference in um, their improvement in their CAPS-5 score. So they went from, uh, if, we, if we weren't on an antidepressant, went from about 88 to 
uh, 45. And if you were, you only had about, you know, 20 points of improvement compared to 40 or more. Um, fewer people um, stopped meeting criteria for PTSD if they were tapered. Uh, so the mechanism for this is not totally clear, but it's probably related to the downregulation of serotonin receptors associated with SSRI use. And theoretically, it could take longer than just the medication washout period for your serotonin receptor density um, to return to higher levels. Um, and another possibility is that there's some physiologic factors related to the disease state itself that makes people less responsive, but we don't exactly know. Um, we completed a, um, a survey study of psilocybin experiences following antidepressant discontinuation to get a better understanding of just how long that residual effect lasts. And we asked respondents about um, how long after they stopped the medication that they took psilocybin, whether it was been to this, you know, one week, one month, one to three month period. Um, we asked about the intensity of their drug effects, along with how strong the effects were relative to the expected dose that they took. So let's say somebody took, you know, a whole big dose and felt almost nothing. They would say that they had reduced effects. So here on the y-axis, we have percent of respondents who reported lower than expected drug effects relative to time here on the x-axis after discontinuation. And we found a fairly smooth um, curve here confirming the sort of gradual reduction in blunted effects over time that lasted probably at least until this one to three month window. Um, and the main takeaway from this is that a significant portion of those who stop an antidepressant may experience blunting of effects as far as you know one to three months out. Um, and that this effect is probably related to the recency of antidepressant use rather than anything related to the disease state itself, which has obvious potential implications for dosing and optimizing care for people with recent uh, antidepressant use. Um, another notable drug interaction we identified, um, the analysis of online trip reports, um, meaning people posting descriptions of their drug experience online on Reddit and other forums um, was this. So we this emerged from a question of like, you know, can we somehow mitigate the risk of precipitating mania in people with bipolar disorder um, when they use psychedelics if they are on a concurrent mood stabilizer? Um, and what we found is actually pretty surprising. Um, in among 62 reports mentioning lithium, almost half of people reported having had a seizure. Many of them ended up in the hospital. Um, this is not what we expected because we, you know, there's not exactly a clear mechanism by which this would happen or an obvious one. Um, and this was not the case for lamotrigine. We had fewer reports. It was only about 34, but uh, no one mentioned having, um, you know, a seizure or any kind of really. Uh, the untoward effect essentially. So something about lithium is especially bad when mixed with classic psychedelics. Um, and the bottom line is there might be serious risks related to medication interactions or certain medical conditions, some of which we have yet to identify. This is just almost kind of an incidental finding. Um, I'll make a final note on, um, on the topic of some early observations from our anorexia nervosa study, which is in a population that has some substantial medical and psychiatric comorbidity. Um, on average, we found that participants in this study seem to be less sensitive to psilocybin than either healthy or depressed samples. Um, and the outcomes were quite variable. Uh, some, on average, they were positive, but they did vary quite a lot more than they have in our depression study, for example. Um, some participants reported, uh, you know, going back home to challenging home environments, and even though they initially felt better, they kind of immediately went back into all sorts of stress and turmoil that made them feel worse or limited their ability to improve. Some people ended up um, going to higher levels of care or needing more support from our team than was initially put into the protocol. Um, and, you know, unlike in other uh, studies we've done with mood disorders, the improvement didn't seem to happen overnight. Um, the behavior change in and of itself for some people, which is required to get better from anorexia, can itself exacerbate anxiety and mood. Um, and it's possible that some people might have benefited from a more structured approach to supporting behavior change in this context to really harness, you know, whatever therapeutic opportunities there were in the subacute period after psilocybin. We did see that like even some of the most meaningful sessions that people have did not always translate to behavioral change for some people. 
And all of this was with a pretty robust and um, involved follow-up integration sort of package. People were seen for many, many sessions, weekly sessions, uh, and bi-weekly sessions in between the longer um, uh, intervals between psilocybin sessions. Um, and all this sort of, it does leave me concerned for the prospects of facilitators in places like Oregon who are just going to be having a high school education plus 120 hours of didactics to really handle and support um, patients with more complicated conditions. The so what um, and how can psychiatrists contribute to all this? So I think there's a clear need um, for clinicians with a strong knowledge base drawing on a critical review of the evidence. Um, and as in other settings, psychiatrists might be best suited to provide the most comprehensive care for the most complicated patients. And we're also pretty well suited, I think, to lead teams and to integrate this sort of treatment into um, existing systems of care, uh, which leads us to how the heck do we actually prepare people for this. So um, we surveyed psychiatry program directors uh, to get a sense of what is actually being offered out there. You know, there, on the one hand, there's a lot of uh, commercially available training programs out there. They're mostly catered to uh, therapists and not necessarily to uh, prescribers or people who are um, have a psychiatry background, essentially. Um, so we just want to know like what is actually happening in our residency training programs. Um, so we had about a 22% response rate, 51 programs responded. Um, and as you can imagine, it's probably skewed a little bit more toward the programs that are uh, more inclusive of this kind of content. So these are probably uh, inflated numbers is my guess. Um, about three quarters offered didactics on ketamine um, and nearly the same amount offered to clinical experience with ketamine. So this is on the rise. Um, but classic psychedelics were less well represented with about 40% of programs offering some kind of uh, didactic material on it. Um, and a third have reported some research opportunities for uh, uh, psychedelics. And the current offerings in most places, they had about one to two hours of materials, um, but they wanted three to five. So there's a little bit of a gap there. And most of the, uh, the most common, commonly cited barrier here was the lack of educational materials uh, among program directors, as well as, you know, no faculty available to teach this stuff, um, some ethical concerns. Lack of evidence was another because, again, this is not exactly an approved treatment yet, but it's, it's uh, maybe coming. Um, so one way that we're working to address this is we've, uh, we have a trans-institutional working group here um, in collaboration with NYU and Yale, and it's funded by Hector Research Institute. Um, the goal of this program that we've started up is to obtain some consensus on learning objectives and core competencies for psychiatrists and psychiatric providers who are going to specialize in this kind of care, um, as well as to generate some initial materials for some classroom-based um, programs that can be used to provide like a basic education on psychedelics across different levels of training. So to be embedded in residency programs and be available to medical students. Um, and maybe even to uh, fellows who are getting some advanced training in this. And finally, each institution uh, at some point will be piloting a, an actual clinical fellowship to train you know, a couple of trainees per year who are going to be um, leading these kinds of uh, robust programs that will have um, great clinical offerings and, and research offerings too. So essentially, we want to raise the bar um, on psychedelic education and medical training by developing some gold standard materials here. And we're working on it. We're about a year or so in. Um, and just a, a final point on some other areas of opportunity for us as uh, at academic medical centers here, where um, you know, as psychiatrists, we can leverage our expertise with clinical populations to really um, study and optimize care and to risk, risk benefit um, analysis. Um, we can collaborate with basic and translational scientists, with public health experts. Um, we can set a standard for clinical training, which is what we're trying to do with our program here, including supervised practicum, um, which is lacking for many of the uh, training programs that are out there now targeting therapists. Um, some people will get some, you know, listen to some lectures and label a certificate, but not actually work with any patients. Um, and finally, you know, we can interface with professional organizations to set reasonable clinical standards and promote safe access to treatment to, to prevent harm. Uh, 
So finally, conclusions here. Um, we're rapidly barreling through this drug development process. Um, other avenues of access are already proliferating and already out there. Um, but while psych psychedelics might be powerful therapeutic tools, they're probably not going to replace the entire toolbox. And, and there still will be a role for many of the existing kinds of care that we provide. Um, at minimum, I think, you know, we're, uh, we have to be informed about the known risks and benefits of psychedelics and to make sure that our trainees who are emerging are, are well informed in that way. Um, and we have this opportunity to set a standard for comprehensive care involving psychedelics and our responsibility to do so. So they're not a silver bullet, but um, probably will have a role just as we always have had with the most complex patient populations. And that's it. So here's some acknowledgments. Here's our here's our working group at our recent retreat that we had last month, and our anorexia team, among others, who've helped along the way. Um, thanks for your attention. We'd be happy to take some questions, talk about some stuff. Thank you, Natalie. That was terrific. Uh, I think you did a really nice job of helping us uh, understand a lot of the very practical issues that 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 might arise in the clinical setting. Um, you know, we already have a bunch of questions, uh, looks like in the chat, but let, let me start with this. The, the, the idea that MDMA might be FDA approved for routine clinical use in a year is, is pretty striking. I mean, a year is not very far off. Uh, and of course, you know, we've had some discussions about getting prepared for the time, uh, uh, when clinical use comes around, but you know, one of my yeah. questions, one of my thoughts about it is that when MDA becomes available, are people going to want to try it for things other than PTSD? I, I suppose insurance might be a barrier, but clinically, would it make sense to try it for things other than PTSD? Um, there, there have been smaller studies. You know, there's a study out there for people with alcohol use disorder um, that shows some positive signals with MDMA assisted treatment. Um, the insurance is going to be the big question is like, are they going to cover it if it's not for an approved? cause probably not um it's not totally clear you know like this is an unusual situation where a schedule one drug might be really rele relegated to clinical use um where the fda might want to be extra careful and limit the use to the approved indications for the first couple of years or so we don't really know at this point um there's probably going to be a rems with a, a central pharmacy for people who will want to prescribe that will have to provide some kind of documentation that a, you know an evaluation was done um, so the question about like off-label use especially in the early years is not totally clear i suspect down the line yeah everyone's gonna want to try it for all sorts of things which is like you know there are many sort of phase two studies looking at that um but we don't really know what it's actually going to whether the payers are going to cover it probably not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you've generated lots of interest there's an awful lot of questions uh, that have come in let's see um uh just ready says i'm curious what your thoughts are on efficacy of psilocybin treatment and integration for the depressed patient who resists contemplation of the life story but only thinks it's biological so so yeah so i mean could Right. So will there be people for whom the psychedelic piece isn't going to be relevant or or, or, or could it be done without the, 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 psych, the psychotherapeutic piece? Uh, well, it sounds like the question is more about like, oh, you know, maybe there's certain patients who believe that their condition is entirely biological, has nothing to do with their narrative history um, and maybe uh, maybe it could be useful for those people or sort of like push them into this contemplative space about their life in a way that they've not been able to do with just psychotherapy. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, your other question about whether this can be done without psychotherapy, like, again, maybe if we look at, you know, many, many years of people just using psychedelics out in the world, most of the time it's not with a therapist. A lot of the time people seem to report having had some kind of, imp you know, important experience. Um, so we don't really know, and I, I think that the, you know the incentives for pharma companies to really lower the the requirement for any kind of psychotherapeutic support is going to be those pressures are going to be kind of high. Um, 
And it's a little bit of an open question about how we're going to resist that, right? Because the FDA does not regulate psychotherapy exactly. And so it might be up to us to really like set a standard about what's what's mm -hmm. appropriate and how we determine what each individual patient needs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Dinah Miller has a lot of questions. I'm going to pick one of them. Um, uh, do we think that ketamine assisted psychotherapy is worth doing? Um, there haven't really been a ton of great studies on it. A lot of the papers on it are just sort of um, outcomes gathered from some clinics out in the community. Um, there's not really a ton of like controlled prospective studies on ketamine assisted psychotherapy. People seem to like the clinicians seem to really <laughs> do it, seem to really like it. But again, that's not exactly the best evidence that it's really worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, but that but it's available you know because ketamine is in this interesting kind of gray zone where it's like kind of a psychedelic it is just out there any anybody can prescribe it uh, as long as they have a you know schedule two license um okay so okay. i think the jury is kind of still out on ketamine okay. assisted psychotherapy but you can go and try it if you want okay. to Paul McHugh says, is the efficacy uh, uh, of this treatment due to insight or due to neural changes, biological changes? We don't really know. I think it's probably both. There are people who believe that insight can be, uh, it doesn't have to be a part of it. The folks who are really into the idea of a so-called non-psychedelic psychedelic. Um, but and so, yeah, I think we still need to to do those studies. There's some interesting ideas that people have out there, you know, administering psychedelics along with, um, for example, a, a benzodiazepine to induce retrograde amnesia. So people don't remember it. And so if people don't remember it, what happens? Do they still feel some kind of benefit? Um, Another interesting corollary is what's happening in our Alzheimer's study. We have people with early stage Alzheimer's who are receiving psilocybin right now, and many of them don't really remember <laughs> their, their experiences at all. Um, um, and yet some report feeling better. Um, um, and so maybe that's another sign that like there's, there's certainly some biological thing happening, and you can also look to the you know preclinical animal data to see that. Um, how much of it is insight or meaning making it's it's not totally clear but i suspect that's that's a chunk of it hmm. interesting thanks ray de paulo says um it seems to me the exclusion criteria means that these the patients being seen are not the most severely depressed patients is that is that is that an accurate assessment um, i mean that's probably the case in any clinical trial looking at a new product right that there are some fairly strict criteria they want to evaluate people who have like a you know a pure treatment resistant depression or major depressive disorder and certainly people out in the world are going to probably be more complex um so i don't know that that's a issue that's unique to you know these trials that we have here mm -hmm. um but i mean you could also just see like for, for the studies that are specifically looking at people with treatment resistant depression the the efficacy is lower than than it was for just major depressive disorder broadly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. James Alori uh, wonders whether um, uh, FDA approval of psilocybin for depression might lead some practitioners to avoid starting with SSRIs or SNRIs because it's of its potential to, to make uh, it harder to eventually succeed with psilocybin treatment. Do you think uh, um, there's a way of handling that? Maybe. Again, I still think that the it's far easier to prescribe an SSRI than it is to get someone in for psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, and one of the you know requirements might be that someone has attempted tr treatment, just like you would for a prior authorization for another new medicine or new treatment, right? Have you attempted the other existing kinds of care that we know work or have some effect in what happened? Um, so I don't know that there's going to be a huge uh, change there in, in the way that James is wondering about, but maybe. Okay, thanks. Brandon Burkett uh, says um, that uh, that in, in order to persuade insurance companies to pay for these sorts of treatments, they're going to want to see very, very large studies. Do you think a multi-site clinical trial with more than a thousand people is possible using these protocols or is there already one in the works? 
Um, I don't know what the what numbers are looking to get for phase three for the the two psilocybin um, studies. I mean, part of it is just sort of like what what effect size you need to to get a significant difference, right? And that's that's part of what um, that's part of how they determine the the size of the the sample that they need. Um, is it possible? I should hope so, right? Because we can hope I hope that we can provide treatment to more than a thousand people across the country, just in general, if this was approved. Um, but it is really costly, right? So, you know, 11 grand per participant is it's a lot of money for a uh, thousand patients. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Tom Sedlak uh, talks about the cost, how the cost of new drugs can be a barrier to implementation of new treatments. Uh, given that there are multiple natural psychedelics, do you think this will shape the cost curve? Um, so that's not what's being up for consideration for rescheduling. That's truly just the synthetic products that these, these three companies are offering. Um, but but it's an interesting question of like the other ways that psychedelics are becoming available, like in Oregon and Colorado. It's a totally different thing. That's that's sort of the the mushroom and the mushroom derived extracts that are out there. Um, and it's and it and it will compete with what's being offered in standard clinical settings. And um, I think we'll just have to see what happens if if there are enough problems with the Oregon model that it becomes obvious and problematic that might get shut down or something. Um, we haven't had a head-to-head -head study of synthetic psilocybin versus you know extract of psilocybin just yet. I, my guess is it probably won't be that different, um, but we don't really know. So, yeah. Thanks. And and uh, last question, John Lipsy says, uh, would you address the issue of adequate double-blind placebo control in psychedelic studies? Would I? Yes, it's, it's a problem. Uh, um, it's an interesting problem because it's not totally clear that, um, you know, that, we, that you can apply this traditional double-blind uh, randomized design to a drug that has such profound subjective effects. Um, and it's been a problem where in the studies that have reported the rates of people who can correctly guess their treatment allocation, it's you know, on the order of like 90 plus percent of people and study therapists can, can know. And so probably there is some inflation in the effect size when you compare placebo and um, the active groups in a lot of these studies. Um, probably what's what's needed is a really convincing active comparison condition. We don't really have that just yet. Um, that you know, an idea might be something like high dose THC. Um, but I suspect that probably, um, you know, the question earlier from Dr. McHugh about what 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 of this is like insight or profound experience or intense emotional experience, kind of in the way that you get with like you know psychotherapy or common factors of psychotherapy as part of the healing mechanism, like. With that in mind, probably my guess is that probably any treatment that involves a really intense emotional experience like this is likely to produce some benefit. Um, so it's a, it's a problem, but for now, FDA has approved the designs that these you know big three companies are using, and don't seem to think that it's a problem or barrier to to getting decent evidence to say that they're safe and effective. Well, thanks, Natalie. You did a terrific job with this. Uh, I, th I think I think we probably all learned quite a lot. Uh, guys, should be we ought to have you back next year to see see where we are with FDA approval and and uh, yeah. where things are in this field that I think is going to be changing pretty fast. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Take care.